In the last month, I have received a number of critical remarks and suggestions which I have to address. Yield and Silverstein's glacier formations. My critics all agree that a nuclear process obliterated the World Trade Center on 9-11. However, we were not able to find common ground in respect to yield, ranging from 0.3 kiloton to 150 kiloton. Critical to this is the question how Silverstein's glacier formations were actually created. Was the rock evaporated on 9-11 or simply carved out by glaciers thousands of years ago? Larry Silverstein and his scientific research team examined the cavities below Tower 4, which I nicknamed Silverstein Valley. The scientific paper is well written, I must admit. However, if we have a look at the infrared 9-11 data map, we notice that Silverstein Valley coincides neatly with a certain hotspot region. In other words, the so-called glacier potholes are identical with the hotspot zones. The North Tower was obliterated forcefully, but we notice that the remaining energy input in the ground was small. The South Tower collapsed with less energy, but we notice that the remaining energy input in the ground was high. Using the three-dimensional map provided by 911 Encyclopedia, we can create an overlay with the expected affected area. The energy distribution pattern fits the expectation. The North Tower's energy input in the ground is small, as much of the energy was efficiently used to obliterate the tower. The South Tower's energy input in the ground is much bigger, and only a part of it was used for destruction. Silverstein's valley is within the affected area, so I started doubting his seemingly honest explanations. On the other hand, we must ask how much yield is needed to produce such a valley. Let us examine a few shots. Shot 1, Starfish Prime, 1400 kiloton yield. A nuclear weapon exploded in space results in a second small sun, glaring for 10 seconds in the sky. The distribution pattern is spherical. All energy is dissipated as radiation as no pressure wave can develop in space. Shot 2, Grable, 15 kiloton yield. A nuclear weapon airburst exploded 160 meters above ground creates a spherical distribution pattern only in the first milliseconds. Then the shock wave is reflected upwards, you get a vertical impulse response from the ground. Simultaneously a base surge develops spreading horizontally. Shot 3, umbrella 8 kiloton yield. A weapon exploded in shallow water creates a vertical spray dome. As a circular shock wave is reflected upwards and the water gives a strong impulse response, the base surge develops, however, its destructive force is limited as it consists of water spray. Shot 4, ESS teapot 1 kiloton yield. A nuclear weapon exploded in shallow ground will produce a strong vertical impulse response. In the case of ESS teapot, material shot up to 200 meters then the energy faded away, the dust cloud structure sank to the ground. However, due to the molten ground in the center of explosion, a mushroom cloud started to rise 60 seconds after the event, indicating the remaining hot spot below the Earth. One of my critics pointed out that modern nuclear weapons are designed as shaped charge and do not have a spherical energy distribution due to neutron and radiation reflectors. The result is concentration of energy in a given direction. He pointed out also that modern nuclear weapons may use a slow fusion fissile process, making the energy output yield softer and longer. In this case, very much depends on the solid angle, how good you can direct the energy towards the target. But again, how much yield is needed to produce Silverstein Valley? A 115 kiloton yield, a second generation nuke as proposed by Dmitry Khalezov, would rather obliterate the entire W2C complex by its pressure force creating the valley. A 0.3 kiloton yield radiation device, a postulated fourth generation radiation directed energy nuke, would destroy the tower by radiation but not heat up the ground, let alone create a melt cavity or Silverstein Valley. It seems to me that the truth is somewhere in the middle of these extremes. I have made a small case study assuming a slow fusion process, a long burn, with a total yield of 27 kiloton. 
For slow fusion burn, the estimated ignition shockwave pattern would be equal to only 1 kiloton, which leaves 26 kiloton for radiation and heat through a slowed down nuclear fissile process. I will make a second video on the hypothetical bomb's design. If you are interested in the details already now, just download the PDF and have a look at page 23. That's all for today. Not entirely my own ideas, but rather the synthesis of several opinions of several critics who contacted me, thanks to them all. In the end, let Larry Silverstein defend himself, maybe his glaciers did also some of the work carving out the valley. The devil is truly in the details, we don't know yet. Take care. unusual conditions exposed on Tower 4 is because it's something that isn't seen anywhere in New York City. The scale and the sculpting is so unusual and different, it's something that we don't get to see on the surface of the ground in the places that we all go. The first time that I went down there, I had no idea what kind of scale it was going to be like. It was just so large in terms of area and in depth, it was quite impressive. These are actual very large sort of whirlpools that have been carved out both deep down into the ground and then swirling around in a large whirlpool area. Most of the glaciers, the big glaciers that have um, come across this area came from the northwest from across New Jersey. Along the way the glacial ice picked up all of these boulders, cobbles, red silt and so on and carried them across what is now the Hudson and used them to scour out these features in New York City and then wound up depositing them both on the site and then further downstream behind us in Brooklyn. Tower 4 is the deepest part of the excavation anywhere. Um, the, the natural scour portion of Tower 4 goes down 100 feet below sea level. The enormity of this is something that should be shared at least to the extent that we can document it. And we had the nice article in the New York Times and they showcased it and everyone uh, seemed to take interest in that. You find these bits and pieces of, of sample very rarely. And so when you find them, you grab them and try and take them, make the most of them. Now the next step is to take the data, the photographs, the samples, information, measurements, and things like that and to take it and start analyzing it. We knew it formed actually hundreds of millions of years ago. We might actually be able to get a more precise date for when this last major glaciation took place. Now it's really the, the point where the tower will rise back up out of, out of the, the past and out of the glacial uh, plunge pool. And in just a couple of months, I think we'll start to see you know, you know, real production and the building will rise above street level and everybody walking along the streets will say, oh yeah, I remember there was, there was something special there.